The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter Twenty One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Twenty One: A Risk or Love. Eh? Eh? He is craven, and he called me doddering fool. The speaker was Igos, and he addressed a knot of chieftains in one of the chambers of the palace of Otar, Jeddak of Manator. If Akor was alive, there were a Jeddak for us. Who says that Akor is dead? demanded one of the chiefs. Where is he then? asked Igos. Have not others disappeared, whom Otar thought too well beloved for men so near the throne as they? The chief shook his head. And I thought that, or knew it rather, I'd join Uthor at the gate of enemies. Sss, cautioned one. Here comes the liquor of feet. And all eyes were turned upon the approaching ethos. Kaor, friends, he exclaimed as he stopped among them but his friendly greeting elicited naught but a few surly nods. "'Have you heard the news?' he continued, unabashed by treatment to which he was becoming accustomed. "'What, has Otar seen an Alcio and fainted?' demanded Igos with broad sarcasm. "'Men have died for less than that, ancient one,' Ethos reminded him. "'I am safe,' retorted Igos, "'for I am not a brave and popular son of the Jeddak of Manator. This was indeed open treason, but Ethos feigned not to hear it. He ignored Igos and turned to the others. Otar goes to the chamber of Omai this night in search of Turan the slave, he said. He sorrows that his warriors have not the courage for so mean a duty and that their jeddak is thus compelled to arrest a common slave, with which taunt Ethos passed on to spread the word in other parts of the palace. As a matter of fact, the latter part of his message was purely original with himself, and he took great delight in delivering it to the discomfiture of his enemies. As he was leaving the little group of men, Igos called after him, at what hour does Otar intend visiting the chambers of Omai? he asked. Toward the end of the eighth zog, replied the major domo, and went his way. We shall see, stated Igos. What shall we see? asked the warrior. We shall see whether Otar visits the chamber of Omai. How? I shall be there myself and if I see him I will know that he has been there. If I don't see him I will know that he is not," explained the old taxidermist. "'Is there anything there to fill an honest man with fear?' asked the chieftain. "'What have you seen?' "'It was not so much what I saw, though that was bad enough, as what I heard,' said Igos. "'Tell us what heard and saw you.' "'I saw the dead, oh my!' said Igos. The others shuddered. "'And you went not mad?' they asked. "'Am I mad?' retorted Igos. "'And you will go again?' "'Yes.' "'Then indeed you are mad!' cried one. "'You saw the dead Omai. Oh "'But what heard you that was worse?' whispered another. "'I saw the dead Omai oh lying upon the floor of his sleeping chamber, with one foot tangled in the sleeping silks and furs upon his couch i heard horrid moans and frightful screams and you are not afraid to go there again demanded several the dead cannot harm me said igos he has slain thus for five thousand years nor can a sound harm me i heard it once and lived i can hear it again it came from almost at my side where I hid behind the hangings and watched the slave Turan before I snatched the woman away from him. 
Igos, you are a very brave man, said a chieftain. Otar called me doddering fool, and I would face worse dangers than lie in the forbidden chambers of Omai. Oh to know it if he does not visit the chamber of Omai, oh then indeed shall Otar fall. The night came, and the zodes dragged, and the time approached when Otar, Jeddak of Manator, was to visit the chamber of Omai oh in search of the slave Turan. To us, who may doubt the existence of malignant spirits, his fear may seem unbelievable, for he was a strong man, an excellent swordsman, and a warrior of great repute, but the fact remained that Otar of Manator was nervous with apprehension as he strode the corridors of his palace toward the deserted halls of Omai, and when he stood at last, with his hand upon the door that opened from the dusty corridor, to the very apartments themselves, he was almost paralyzed with terror. He had come alone for two very excellent reasons, the first of which was that thus none might note his terror-stricken state, nor his defection should he fail at the last moment, and the other was that should he accomplish the thing alone, or be able to make his chiefs believe that he had, the credit would be far greater than were he to be accompanied by warriors. But though he had started alone, he had become aware that he was being followed, and he knew that it was because his people had no faith in either his courage or his veracity. He did not believe that he would find the slave Turan. He did not very much want to find him, for though Otar was an excellent swordsman and a brave warrior in physical combat. He had seen how Turan had played with Udor, and he had no stomach for a passage at arms with one whom he knew outclassed him. And so Otar stood with his hand upon the door, afraid to enter, afraid not to. But at last his fear of his own warriors, watching behind him, grew greater than the fear of the unknown behind the ancient door, and he pushed the heavy skeel aside and entered. Silence and gloom and the dust of centuries lay heavy upon the chamber. From his warriors he knew the route that he must take to the horrid chamber of Omai, and so he forced his unwilling feet across the room before him, across the room where the Jitan player sat at the eternal game, and came to the short corridor that led into the room of Omai. His naked sword trembled in his grasp. He paused after each forward step to listen, and when he was almost at the door of the ghost-haunted chamber his heart stood still within his breast, and the cold sweat broke from the clammy skin of his forehead, for from within there came to his affrighted ears the sound of muffled breathing. Then it was that Otar of Manator came near to fleeing from the nameless horror that he could not see, but that he knew lay waiting for him in that chamber just ahead. But again came the fear of the wrath and contempt of his warriors and his chiefs. They would degrade him, and they would slay him into the bargain. There was no doubt of what his fate would be should he flee the apartments of Omai in terror. His only hope, therefore, lay in daring the unknown in preference to the known. He moved forward. A few steps took him to the doorway. The chamber before him was darker than the corridor, so that he could just indistinctly make out the objects in the room. He saw a sleeping dais near the center, with a darker blotch of something lying on the marble floor beside it. He moved a step farther into the doorway, and the scabbard of his sword scraped against the stone frame. To his horror he saw the sleeping silks and furs upon the central dais move. He saw a figure slowly arising to a sitting position from the deathbed of Omai the Cruel. His knees shook, but he gathered all his moral forces, and gripping his sword more tightly in his trembling fingers 
prepared to leap across the chamber upon that horrid apparition. He hesitated just a moment. He felt eyes upon him, ghoulish eyes that bored through the darkness into his withering heart, eyes that he could not see. He gathered himself for the rush, and then there broke from the thing upon the couch an awful shriek, and Otar sank senseless to the floor. Gahan rose from the couch of Omai, smiling, only to swing quickly about with drawn sword as the shadow of a noise impinged upon his keen ears from the shadows behind him. Between the parted hangings he saw a bent and wrinkled figure. It was Igos. "'Sheath your sword, Turan,' said the old man. "'You have naught to fear from Igos. "'What do you here?' demanded Gahan. I came to make sure that the great coward did not cheat us, eh? And he called me doddering fool, but look at him now, stricken, insensible by terror, but, eh, one might forgive him that who had heard your uncanny scream. It all but blasted my own courage, and it was you, then, who moaned and screamed when the chiefs came that day that I stole terror from you. It was you, then, old scoundrel, demanded Gahan moving threateningly toward Igos. "'Come, come!' expostulated the old man. "'It was I. But then I was your enemy. I would not do it now. Conditions have changed.' "'How have they changed? What has changed them?' asked Gahan. "'Then I did not fully realize the cowardice of my Jeddak, or the bravery of you and the girl. I am an old man from another age and I love courage. At first I resented the girl's attack upon me, but later I came to see the bravery of it, and it won my admiration, as have all her acts. She feared not Otar, she feared not me, she feared not all the warriors of Manator, and you, blood of a million sires, how you fight! I am sorry that I exposed you at the fields of Jitan. I am sorry that I dragged the girl Tara back to Otar. I would make amends. I would be your friend. Here is my sword at your feet. And drawing his weapon, Igos cast it to the floor in front of Gahan. The Gatholian knew that scarce the most abandoned of knaves would repudiate this solemn pledge, and so he stooped and picking up the old man's sword, returned it to him, hilt first, in acceptance of his friendship. "'Where is the princess Tara of Helium?' asked Gahan. "'Is she safe?' "'She is confined in the tower of the women's quarters, awaiting the ceremony that is to make her Jadara a Manator," replied Igos. "'This thing dared think that Tara of Helium would mate with him?' growled Gahan. I will make short work of him if he is not already dead from fright. And he stepped toward the fallen Otar to run his sword through the Jeddak's heart. No, cried Igos. Slay him not, and pray that he not be dead if you would save your princess. How is that? asked Gahan. If word of Otar's death reached the quarters of the women, the princess Tara would be lost. They know Otar's intention of taking her to wife, and making her Jadara a Venator, so you may rest assured that they all hate her with the hate of jealous women. Only Otar's power protects her from harm. Hmm. Should Otar die, they would turn her over to the warriors and the male slaves, for there would be none to avenge her. Gahan sheathed his sword. Your point is well taken. But what shall we do with him? Leave him where he lies, counseled Igos. He is not dead. When he revives, he will return to his quarters with a fine tale of his bravery, and there will be none to impugn his boasts, none but Igos. Come, he may revive at any moment, and he must not find us here. Igos crossed to the body of his jeddak, knelt beside it for an instant, and then returned past the couch to Gahan. The two quit the chamber of Omai, and took their way toward the spiral runway. 
Here I, Gos, led Gahan to a higher level and out upon the roof of that portion of the palace from where he pointed to a high tower quite close by. There, he said, lies the Princess of Helium, and quite safe she will be until the time of the ceremony. Safe, possibly, from other hands, but not from her own, said Gahan. She will never become Jadara of Manator. First she will destroy herself. She would do that? asked Igos. She will, unless you can get word to her that I still live and that there is yet hope, replied Gahan. I cannot get word to her, said Igos. The quarters of his women Otar guards with jealous hand. Here are his most trusted slaves and warriors, yet even so, thick among them are countless spies, so that no man knows which be which. No shadow falls within those chambers that is not marked by a hundred eyes. Gahan stood gazing at the lighted windows of the high tower, in the upper chambers of which Tara of Helium was confined. I will find a way, Igos, he said. There is no way, replied the old man. For some time they stood upon the roof beneath the brilliant stars and hurtling moons of dying Mars, laying their plans against the time that Tara of Helium should be brought from the high tower to the throne room of Otar. It was then, and then alone, argued Igos, that any hope of rescuing her might be entertained. Just how far he might trust the other, Gahan did not know, and so he kept to himself the knowledge of the plan that he had forwarded to Floran and Valdor by Ghek, but he assured the ancient taxidermist that if he were sincere in his oft-repeated declaration that Otar should be denounced and superseded, he would have his opportunity on the night that the Jeddak sought to wed the Heliumetic princess. "'Your time shall come then, Igos," Gahan assured the other, and if you have any party that thinks as you do, prepare them for the eventuality that will succeed Otar's presumptuous attempt to wed the daughter of the warlord. Where shall I see you again, and when? I go now to speak with Tara, Princess of Helium. I like your boldness, said Igos, but it will avail you not. You will not speak with Tara, Princess of Helium, though doubtless the blood of many Manatorians will drench the floors of the women's quarters before you are slain. Gahan smiled. I shall not be slain. Where and when shall we meet? But you may find me in Omai's chamber at night. That seems the safest retreat in all Manator, for an enemy of the Jeddak in whose palace it lies. I go. And may the spirits of your ancestors surround you, said Igos. After the old man had left him, Gahan made his way across the roof to the high tower, which appeared to have been constructed of concrete and afterward elaborately carved, its entire surface being covered with intricate designs cut deep into the stone-like material of which it was composed. Though wrought ages since, it was but little weather-worn owing to the aridity of the Martian atmosphere, the infrequency of rains, and the rarity of dust storms. To scale it, though, presented difficulties and danger that might have deterred the bravest of men, that would doubtless have deterred Gahan, had he not felt that the life of the woman he loved depended upon his accomplishing the hazardous feat. Removing his sandals and laying aside all of his harness and weapons other than a single belt supporting a dagger, the Gatholian essayed the dangerous ascent. Clinging to the carvings with hands and feet, he worked himself slowly aloft, avoiding the windows, and keeping upon the shadowy side of the tower, away from the light of Thuria and Kluros. The tower rose some fifty feet above the roof of the adjacent part of the palace, comprising five levels or floors with windows looking in every direction. A few of the windows were balconied, and these more than others he sought to avoid, although it being now near the close of the ninth zode, 
there was little likelihood that many were awake within the tower. His progress was noiseless, and he came at last, undetected, to the windows of the upper level. These, like several of the others he had passed at lower levels, were heavily barred, so that there was no possibility of his gaining ingress to the apartment where Tara was confined. Darkness hid the interior behind the first window that he approached. The second opened upon a lighted chamber, where he could see a guard sleeping at his post outside a door. Here also was the top of the runway, leading to the next level below. Passing still farther around the tower, Gahan approached another window, but now he clung to that side of the tower which ended in a courtyard a hundred feet below, and in a short time the light of Thuria would reach him. He realized that he must hasten, and he prayed that behind the window he now approached he would find Tara of Helium. Coming to the opening he looked in upon a small chamber, dimly lighted. In the center was a sleeping dais upon which a human form lay beneath silks and furs. A bare arm, protruding from the coverings, lay exposed against a black and yellow-striped orlock skin, an arm of wondrous beauty about which was clasped an armlet that Gahan knew. No other creature was visible within the chamber, all of which was exposed to Gahan's view. Pressing his face to the bars, the Gatholian whispered her dear name. The girl stirred, but did not awaken. Again he called, but this time louder. Tara sat up and looked about, and at the same instant a huge eunuch leaped to his feet from where he had been lying on the floor, close by that side of the dais farthest from Gahan. Simultaneously the brilliant light of Thuria flashed full upon the window where Gahan clung silhouetting him plainly to the two within. Both sprang to their feet. The eunuch drew his sword and leaped for the window where the helpless Gahan would have fallen an easy victim to a single thrust of the murderous weapon the fellow bore, had not Tara of Helium leaped upon her guard dragging him back. At the same time she drew the slim dagger from its hiding place in her harness, and even as the eunuch sought to hurl her aside, its keen point found his heart. Without a sound he died, and lunged forward to the floor. Then Tara ran to the window. "'Turan, my chief!' she cried. "'What awful risk is this you take to seek me here, where even your brave heart is powerless to aid me?' "'Be not so sure of that, heart of my heart,' he replied. "'While I bring but words to my love, they be the forerunner of deeds, I hope that will give her back to me forever. I feared that you might destroy yourself, Tara of Helium, to escape the dishonor that Otar would do you, and so I came to give you new hope and to beg that you live for me through whatever may transpire, in the knowledge that there is yet a way, and that if all goes well we shall be freed at last. Look for me in the throne room of Otar the night that he would wed you, and now, how may we dispose of this fellow? He pointed to the dead eunuch upon the floor. We need not concern ourselves about that, she replied. None dares harm me for fear of the wrath of Otar. Otherwise I should have been dead so soon as ever I entered this portion of the palace, for the women hate me. Otar alone may punish me, and what cares Otar for the life of a eunuch? No, fear not upon this score. Their hands were clasped between the bars, and now Gahan drew her nearer to him. One kiss, he said, before I go, my princess, and the proud daughter of Dejah Thoris, princess of Helium, and the warlord of Barsoom whispered, my chieftain, and pressed her lips to the lips of Turan, the common pentham. This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter 21, recording by Tom Weiss.